When I began researching material for spoils of war, I quickly discovered that there were far more objects held in private hands than I had ever imagined. Many of these collections belonged to families with a long tradition of service in the armed forces. Consequently, the objects come from not just one battle or war, but a whole succession of them. Given the current sensitivities around the subject and the ever-present danger of burglary, most of the owners whose spoils are in my book have preferred to remain anonymous. One such is a Scottish family with an extensive and diverse collection spanning two centuries, whose oldest trophy was actually the most recently acquired. The object in question is the smoke-stained skull of a Chinaman. This skull, which dates from the mid-19th century, was acquired, if that's the right word, by the head-hunting Murats of Sarawak during the suppression of piracy in the region led by Sir James Brooke, the White Raja of Sarawak. It was given, with great ceremony, to the present owner by the Murats in 1966 when he completed a two-year military posting to them during the so-called confrontation with Indonesia. As he relates, the tribesmen under my command were primitive people who had only recently given up being headhunters, evidence of which was very much on display in their communal log houses. As trophies of battle, the skulls were afforded considerable respect. In due course, the owner returned to the UK with the decapitated remains of the Chinaman. At Heathrow, he had considerable difficulty persuading Her Majesty's Customs and Excise that he was not an accomplice in some horrific murder. Eventually, they let the skull and its new owner through without either raising duty on the gift or placing him in the hands of the police. And he deposited the skull with his mother at his family home. As he told me, to say that she was less than delighted with this gruesome trophy would be a considerable understatement. She was even less than impressed when I explained that, according to the Murat tradition, every six months the skull had to be smoked and then walked around the boundary of the house so that the spirit attached to the skull could observe any additions to the property and thereby not become restless. I also warned her that, according to the Murats, if these procedures were not followed, the spirit of the skull would break up the house. Unfortunately, his mother did not observe the Murat traditions and instead consigned the Chinese spirit to the attic. She soon wished that she hadn't, for, without any reason, pictures fell from the walls, a glass decanter, a family heirloom of great antiquity, shattered, as did a large Chinese vase. At this point, his mother decided that enough was enough, and she instructed her son to send the skull to the Highlanders Museum at Fort George. This he duly did, along with clear instructions that the skull should be taken around the museum before being placed in a display cabinet. The warning was ignored, and it wasn't long before inexplicable injuries to the museum's staff and property started to occur. On hearing of these mishaps, the owner told the curator to do as he had earlier instructed his mother to do, and all would be well. So, one bleak winter's evening, the skull was duly walked around Fort George. Since when, there have been no problems. We now move from the highlands of Scotland to the ornate palaces and temples of Burma. Although the assembly of the British Indian Empire was largely completed by 1850, it took a few more decades to add the jewels of some outlying territories on the subcontinent to the Indian Crown Imperial. The largest of these was Burma, the incremental conquest of which was concluded in 1885 with the Third Anglo-Burmese War, which also ended the seven-year reign of the 26-year-old King Thibor Min. This was not at all what Thibor Min had envisaged in 1878 when, age 19, he stepped over a hundred bloody corpses of his nearest and dearest relations and onto the Burmese throne, the youthful beneficiary of a palace coup cold-bloodedly plotted and executed by his mother-in-law, Queen Hin's Biu Machin, whose only known photograph is shown on the right of the slide. However, it was not just King Thibor Min's rice fields that were seized by the British. The contents of the king's numerous palaces were also confiscated, and piles of jewellery, silks, gold, and the vast lion throne were shipped off to Delhi and London. 
Meanwhile, in Mandalay, a prize committee was set up to auction off what remained, including the king's bee throne from the glass palace shown on the right of the slide. Unfortunately, no image exists of the short leg platform covered with an ornate carpet which was made of gilded caraway wood and so called because it was embellished with 36 carved and gilded bees, but it must have looked a bit like this. Ironically, the bees were supposed to symbolise Thibor Min's wisdom, which unfortunately for him had not extended to his dealings with the British. Presumably, the prize committee determined that no one would be interested in bidding for a complete throne, and so the bees decorating it were auctioned off separately. One of these insects now lies in a safe in an English country house. Although of no particular merit as a piece of wood carving, this crudely fashioned object is nonetheless of considerable value. The carcass of the bee-less throne, along with six other thrones which remained in Burma, were destroyed in a bombing raid during the Second World War. The only survivor, the vast lion throne shown on the left, was returned to Burma in 1948 on independence and is now on display at the National Museum in Yangon, formerly Rangoon, the capital of Myanmar, formerly Burma. As for the bees, the whereabouts of only four of the carvings are now known. Two are in the Victoria and Albert Museum, one is in the Pitt Rivers Museum in Oxford, and the fourth is in the country house safe belonging to our collector. Thirteen years after the fall of the Burmese monarchy, an Anglo-Egyptian force under the command of the future Field Marshal Earl Kitchener of Khartoum, shown on the left, and including a young Winston Churchill on his right, was dispatched to Sudan to end the Mahdist uprising in that country. This was a revolt that had cost the life of General Gordon in the same year that King Thibor Min was deposed. The Mahdi, shown here in the top left, had died shortly after Gordon and was buried in an elaborate tomb in the town of Omdurman. This monument was used during the battle as an aiming point for Kitchener's gunboats. In the aftermath, the Mahdi's final resting place was ransacked by British troops. His skull was presented to Kitchener, his bones were thrown in the Nile, and the double-sided panels inset into the tabernacle around his sarcophagus were distributed amongst the troops. Several of these panels were turned into shooting trophies by the Queen's own Cameron Highlanders, three of which were won by our collector. He retains two and presented a third to the Highlanders Museum, where it joins a fourth presented to the regiment by Lieutenant, later Brigadier General, Rudolf Adlercron. We now return to the jungles of Burma, this time in 1945, for the final items in the collection. These include a British 25-pounder gun, captured by the Japanese, a Japanese regimental flag, complete with bloodstains and bullet holes, a Japanese officer's sword, and several imperial sword hilts, all of which were acquired first-hand by the present owner's father, and, with the exception of the field gun, which was returned to the British, are held by him along with the other spoils of war already described in this video. I do hope you've enjoyed this brief look at a wonderful private collection of spoils of war. Many more are to be found in my book of the same name, which is now available on Amazon.